Seconds before landing, a young first officer in training is facing his most challenging approach yet. Battling the fierce winds of northern Spain in Bilbao, the pilots of the A320 bring it in for landing. But somehow, everything goes wrong during the last few seconds before touchdown and the A320 slams into the runway, nose first. What happened here and was the unexperienced co-pilot to blame? Subscribe so you won't miss any future episodes. Let's get into it. Welcome to Airspace. On February 7th, 2001, Iberia Airlines 1456 had just departed from Barcelona for its short flight to Bilbao in northern Spain. In the cockpit were three pilots that night. A captain, an experienced first officer on the observer seat and a rather young first officer in training at the controls in the right seat, age 24. The young first officer had successfully completed his pilot training and simulator sessions in the A320 simulator and now he was soon due to earn his wings after gaining his first months of experience on the real Airbus A320. It might seem strange for my American colleagues to hear of such young airline pilots, as it is common practice in the US to have pilots fly many years commercially on small aircraft or business jets before eventually obtaining a job for a major airline much later in life. Pilot training is handled very different in Europe. Here, most flight schools accept students which wish to become airline pilots starting at age 20. Pilot training is then very focused on gaining the experience needed to fly larger airliners and does not focus as much on other aspects of flight, like navigating by sight, since that is very rarely used during regular airline flights. This approach to pilot training is very effective in my view, but I might be biased since I received exactly that kind of training to obtain my license. This kind of training enables first officers to start their career very young, reaching the airliner cockpit of an Airbus A320 or Boeing 737 for example, at the age of 23 or 24, after roughly three years of very intense and demanding training. But let's go back to Iberia 1456. Shortly before their descent, the cockpit crew conducted the approach briefing for Bilbao. The city is situated close to the sea, and the approach to runway 30 leads to a valley surrounded by hilly terrain. This often leads to turbulent approaches, since the wind blowing over the hills creates whirls and rotors of air. Also, a phenomenon called mountain waves may be present. Due to the terrain, the wind is forced to rise over the hills, and the air mass forms a wave. This leads to even more turbulence. When the wind is blowing straight from the sea, approaches to runway 30 are rather straightforward, since the wind is nicely channeled into the valley. But on that night, winds were reported to be gusty at a speed of 60 knots, that is 70 miles per hour or 110 kilometers per hour, at 7,000 feet, blowing almost perpendicular to the valley, coming from a direction of 240 degrees. Later on ground, the wind was reported to be weaker at a speed of only 8 to 15 knots, which is usually easily manageable. As the plane descended on the glide slope, the approach was rather turbulent, but the aircraft came in nicely and the first officer handled the plane well having the airport in sight from miles away. But during the last few seconds before landing, things went terribly wrong very quickly. The plane found itself crossing various up and down drafts just before touchdown and the first officer fought hard to keep up in these wind shear conditions. As the plane was already over the runway, it was suddenly pushed down violently and its nose dropped. Reflexively, the first officer and the captain pulled their side six back, trying to arrest the large rate of descent, but the plane did not react. An instant later, the captain pushed the thrust levers fully forward and attempted to go around, but it was too late. The aircraft struck the runway nose landing gear first at a vertical acceleration of 4.75 g. A normal landing is between 1.1 and 1.3 g and everything above 2.1 g is considered a hard landing, just to put the value of 4.75 g in perspective. The nose gear immediately folded backwards and all tires of the main gear struts blew due to the impact forces. The plane skidded 800 meters down the runway on its wheel rims, the engines and the nose, and eventually came to a standstill almost perpendicular to the runway axis. The plane was evacuated and everyone made it out, however there were several injuries due to the impact and the evacuation. I can only imagine how the first officer must have felt at that point. I'm sure he was blamed right away for the rough landing. Breaking anything is a major fear for most new first officers. It must have been terrible for him to see the outcome of one of his first approaches on the real job. The investigation that soon followed took a close look on various possible causes for the crash and was able to conclude that the first officer fulfilled his duties correctly and flew the plane according to best practices. But one part of the testimonies by the pilots puzzled the investigators. 
Both the captain and the first officer stated that they had instinctively pulled back on their side sticks to arrest the rate of descent shortly before touchdown, but nothing had happened. The plane did not seem to react and even dropped the nose further. Considering these statements, the investigators studied the flight data recorder and were able to determine that indeed the pilots told the truth. Both had attempted to save the plane from the violent impact, but the plane did not react. In fact, during this most critical phase, the plane itself had tried to save its pilots from harm, but the computer's good intentions were unfortunately highly uncalled for in that situation. You see, the A320's flight controls are not directly actuated by cables and pulleys like it was the case for older aircraft. Instead, the control inputs made by the pilots are first sent to the flight control computers, which then actuate the flight control surfaces. This enables many protections, such as a protection against turns that are too steep or protections against excessive flight maneuvers. Among these protections is also one that is called the Alpha protection. Sounds ominous, but its working principle is rather simple to understand. It prevents the aircraft from achieving angles of attack that are too high, thus preventing the aircraft from entering a stall. If the plane were to stall, the flow of air around the wing would be disturbed and the plane would start falling out of the sky. This is a very dangerous condition and the Alpha protection seeks to avoid that at all costs. It works by measuring the actual angle of attack, called Alpha, of the plane with these angle of attack vanes. They are basically just vanes that are able to spin freely, measuring the angle of the incoming air, like a flag in the wind. Then, the measured angle of attack is compared to a maximum allowable angle. If the maximum allowable angle of attack is achieved and the pilots continue to demand more nose-up pitch, the flight control computers just tell the pilots no and stop providing the nose-up input, keeping the plane at the maximum allowable angle of attack. This keeps the plane from stalling. However, the flight control computers of the A320 have a feature that goes beyond just measuring the angle of attack. They even predict the future angle of attack based on pilot input. With that knowledge, let's look at the accident case. When the pilots were over the runway and attempted to land the aircraft, they encountered several very strong up and down drafts and an increasing tailwind. This increased the plane's angle of attack to 10 degrees. The maximum angle of attack the Alpha protection allowed at this moment was 15 degrees. When the tailwind increased and the plane started to drop, the pilots pulled back on the side sticks simultaneously, which caused their inputs to be added to each other, providing a very large, reflexive pitch-up input. The alpha protection activated, since it figured that this large input would eventually stall the aircraft, and it discarded the nose-up inputs by the pilots. In fact, it even lowered the nose more and more, as the speed of the plane was decreasing and the angle of attack was increasing, and the alpha protection tried to help avoiding the oncoming stall. However, this was uncalled for since the actual angle of attack was still at around 10 degrees or less and the protection was only activated due to the perceived large input by the pilot. The alpha protection accelerated the rate of descent and the plane struck the runway at a rate of descent of 1200 feet per minute. This is highly excessive. After the crash, Airbus soon revised their flight control software of the A320. It was released to all A319, 320 and 321 planes about a year after the crash. Now, the alpha protection will no longer activate below 200 feet, so that an accident like that of Iberia 1456 will be avoided in the future. Several other safety recommendations were released as well. One of them stated that if a pilot wants to take over control, like the captain of this flight did, he should always press the take over button on the side stick, so he has the sole control of the aircraft. If the pilot taking over does not do that, control orders are added to each other and may be excessive. The accident aircraft was almost new at the time of the accident. However, after such a jarring impact, it was damaged beyond repair and had to be written off. I know that this video will probably spark a discussion about whether aircraft automation is a good thing or not. Yes, a system that was intended to help flight crews cause this accident, but it would be wrong to demonize aircraft automation entirely. Automation has made aviation safer by a large margin, but it does not come without its caveats. One day I might make a video about that. If you're interested, let me know in the comments down below. Thank you very much for watching, I hope you liked this week's video. Make sure to subscribe so you won't miss any future episodes. See you next week.